I was thinking about on New Year's Eve, we were out with some very close friends, and, and we always ask the question, what was the highlight and the low light of, of the past year as we think about the next year? And I thought, in ways, maybe my favorite moment of last year was, uh, was both beautiful and painful. And, and once a year, I take a group of donors, or potential donors, uh, to one of our programs around the world. And I always take one of my children along because it's a chance I travel a lot and it's a chance to, to really share uh, the experience. And this was the first time I've taken my youngest daughter, Lily, and, uh, and we went to Cambodia, which was uh, so a big stretch. Habitat has a great program there. And there was a, we were building alongside a woman named Soy Lorne. And um, by material standards, when Jesus talked about the least of these, um, she had had a really tough time. She and her husband contracted HIV AIDS. Her husband died. Um, even before they died, they were living on a garbage dump in a, in a one-room shack that flooded with sewage on a regular basis with no access to fresh water, no sanitation. And, uh, and then when he died, they couldn't afford the rent even on their little shack. And they were squatting uh, in a tough uh, area of Phnom Penh uh, just with a tarp over their meager possessions. And the night before we dedicated her home, um, it had just rained torrentially. This was summertime, in the end, towards the late part of the rainy season. And she had spent the whole night, uh, she told me, standing up, just trying to keep the tarp from ripping apart and keeping their meager possessions and her mom and, uh, and two children somewhat dry. And we, uh, we, we dedicated the house, and then a big storm rolled in. And so she invited us all into her new home, very simple one-room block home and, uh, and we all rushed inside. We had just put the wooden shutters on the, uh, the windows and the rain is just pelting down. And I watched her and her daughter as they were both looking around the ceiling and they were just watching to see if any water was gonna come in their new house. And it was, com I'm very happy to say, completely dry <laughs> in spite of my poor construction ability. And, uh, and this smile just broke out on their faces as, um, you know, we talk about a, a home, and it's something so many of us just take for granted, but this is, we also talk about building hope. And suddenly, for her children, this was gonna be one of those inflection points. Now, for the first time, they're gonna be able to go to school. They were gonna be able to stay healthy. They had access to proper sanitation, fresh water. And, uh, and instead of just thinking about survival, um, they could think about a future. And, uh, and those, are, those are the good days. Those are the days that, uh, that just, lift the spirits and where you just have such a sense of God's presence. And those are the days that can keep us, keep me running fast all the rest of the time. You know, we've just come out of, of Advent for those in the Catholic Episcopal tradition. We had Epiphany this week. And, uh, and as we think about the hope of the Messiah and the expectation that comes with it, um, one of pastor I love is Tim Keller in New York, and he teaches beautifully on this idea of Emmanuel and how radical that is. Emmanuel, the idea of God with us. And first he emphasizes God with us. We serve a mighty God who's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we could ask or imagine. And just the, the awesomeness of that. Second, he offers us the assurance of God with us. The idea that we don't have to do this by ourselves which is a huge idea in itself, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, he reminds us that it is God with us that we have the incredible privilege of getting to try to be the hands and feet of God's work and sharing his love in a world that needs it so much. So whatever stage of life we're in, our question we need to be asking is, what does God want us to do? And the, uh, if those, any Presbyterians here, so the Westminster Confession would say that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, which is a lovely thought. But very practically, how do you, how do, you do that? What does that look like for all of us? And it is, um, I feel so unbelievably blessed now because really for the first time this last decade, um, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. And that really wasn't true much of my life. And so, uh, so getting to serve with Habitat has been really, for me, my, my dream job. Um, but I often say I think God has a sense of humor because go growing up, the path was anything but clear and, uh, and certainly had no idea that this is how all the dots of my often um, surprising career tied together.
But one of my goals for that year was to, to really come to grips with my faith and or at least think more seriously. And I had grown up in a non-traditional Catholic family. My dad was a, from a secular Jewish family and he converted on his own in high school. And my mother was from a high Episcopal family and, uh, and grudgingly converted to Catholicism because there wasn't as much flexibility. And um, so they were charismatic Catholics in the renewal movement in the, in the church. And I had always viewed myself as a Christian, but somehow had just drifted, never rejected, but, but it was not a driving force in my life. And somehow I had grown up, even with very devout family, not really having this idea of a personal relation. God was big God, but not, not an approachable God for me. And I think God really put that person in my life that was um, at the, exactly the right time. And the other loose scholar and the only non-Korean I saw on a weekly basis was a man named Jim Peterson, who is a lifelong friend. And uh, Jim is one of the world's experts on the ethics of genetic engineering, but had just finished his doctorate and was teaching ethics at a Korean university. And he, um, I had run into people who had this burning faith, uh, it was so impressive to me, but couldn't articulate it or defend it in a way that, uh, so it was easy for me to poke holes and, and work. And I'd met other people who were brilliant, but they didn't have, didn't seem to have any of that sense of, uh, of really that spirit in them. And Jim was one of the first people I knew who fully integrated that. And he had this just quiet, calm confidence that was so, such a contrast to my kind of raw ambition and unbridled uh, uh, striving. And he did the most remarkable gift. He got to know me and then just challenged me um, partway through. And I said, now it's something I want to do. And he gave me every Monday night for the rest of that year and gave me big homework assignments and we did systematic theology and worked through the Bible. And it was, uh, and it was through that process. And in some ways, it's hard to explain to our kids in a, in a pre-internet world, I was so removed from everything. It took about three weeks for letters to go back and forth. Our phones were tapped and it cost a fortune to make a phone call. And, uh, and so, it was, um, so it was really isolated, but gave me time to, to think and read and be reflective, which is, is not my nature. And it was really through that process in March of 1987 that I got to the point where I was really willing to surrender, which was hard for me to do, I'd rather be in control, and to move from the idea of big God to this idea of, of Jesus really being Lord and Savior. And, uh, and I would say it didn't necessarily make life easier, which I don't think God promises, but there's no question it has made life more joyful and, uh, and meaningful ever since. And the one thing that was very special, another of those inflection points, is that with my wife's blessing, I went on a, a mission trip to India. And I'd never, I'd always struggled to take the time, and I didn't want to take time away with the family. But in this case, I had lots of time for the family, so she, uh, she blessed it. And I went off and served just for a couple of weeks with, uh, in, in Uttar Pradesh in central India, and served with a, a group known as the Bungi. And in, in India, the Dalits, uh, pejoratively called the untouchables, are at the, the bottom of the caste system in India. And the Bungi are at the bottom of the bottom of the caste system. So literally, these are families that are only allowed to hand clean latrines and clean up dead animals. And they're not allowed to live in the same communities with everyone else. They live outside the walls. And even today, um, about half of the children in these families die before the age of 13 because of the conditions they live in. And um, and it just shattered me. And all those sort of latent social justice feelings just kind of bubbled back up. And to see both the, the horrific conditions that God's children were living in was so upsetting. And then also what a relatively small you know, group of, of uh, people could do to make a difference. And um, right when I started Habitat, a passionate Bill Hybels, who has become a friend, coined a phrase that I loved. And he talked about a holy discontent. And I think for me, this was my holy discontent moment. And you know, what he would say is, is, gosh, in our society, we have so much discontent. People are watching TV, and they see these terrible events unfold in their community, the world, and the response is, that's terrible. Somebody ought to do something about that. And then they change the channel, watch a movie. And, um, and a holy discontent, in contrast, is where you're watching those same terrible events unfold in your community and the world. And God grabs you by the neck, and the response is, I can't stand that. 
and I'm going to do something about it. You get off the couch and out in the community and decide you're going to be a part of making a difference. And I came back from that trip not knowing what I was going to do, but pretty well convinced that I wanted to spend the rest of my time doing something to, to alleviate poverty in the world. And, um, and I came back and I turned down two great jobs in the business world. And they were just, you know, grit your teeth. It's like, oh, that sounds amazing, but God has called me and I'm going to go off and find something to do to serve the poor. And then all the doors started closing. And I got to be the I got to the finals of uh, to run two different international nonprofits, and in both cases they picked somebody who'd already run an international nonprofit, which was perfectly reasonable but disappointing to me. And um, and I'm thinking, God, I thought we had this figured out. We had a I was going to go, you were going to do open the doors, and it was um, it was a really humbling time. And and the months kind of dragged on, and it was wonderful for the family. I got to spend so much time with our kids. I volunteered with everything. I was doing so much volunteering at church, and that part was very rich. But especially for guys, and I think for everybody, but guys especially, we can get our, our identities and our egos awfully tied up in, in what we do. And as a, um, as a spiritual discipline, actually, I made a commitment that when somebody would say, what do you do, which is usually the second question you get when you meet somebody, and uh, that I was, I wasn't, I was just going to say, you know, I'm just staying home with my kids and trying to think about what, figure out what I'm going to do next, and not go, but I used to be a, a something, <laughs> and, uh, and it was so interesting, because some people just would dismiss me offhand, and, and uh, which was uncomfortable, and time dragged on, and and I thought, and if I'm really honest, which I couldn't see at the time, but I think if I'm really honest, where I was in the early side of that time was, okay, God, I will do anything you want as long as it meets my financial and ego gratification and geographic uh, location preferences and, uh, and then anything you want. And I had to work through that to a point where it was, okay, best as I'm able, God, you know, your call, anything... Uh, anything I want. And I don't know how many of you have seen a book called Halftime. And I had always, uh, a guy named Bob Buford was a very successful business guy who then switched. And he coined a phrase I really liked, of, of this idea of moving from success to significance. And I thought, okay, I'm going to you know, get to some level and then cross over. And I thought, you know, I don't really need to wait. But now all of a sudden it was just, um, it was waiting a lot more than I wanted to wait. And uh, and then very much to my surprise, uh, my local church asked, which was just exploding at that time and doing some wonderful things, asked if I would um, come and basically run the church so the senior pastor could focus on his on preaching and being the spiritual leader. And uh, would I come and be what they call an executive pastor and our executive minister and, and lead all the staff and the, and the ministries of the church? And I thought, you know, no, that's not my plan. God's calling me to go do international work so the poor, but the church was actually doing wonderful things. And as we prayed about it and thought about it, um, it seemed what, as if that was what I should do. And all my friends that I counted on for career advice thought this was a really, really bad idea. They felt like this was going to be career suicide and that, uh, that you know, if, I, if it was a mistake, no company, there are companies that would just never hire me again. And I thought, you know, if this is a mistake and I really should be back in the business world, if a company wouldn't hire me because I went to serve in my local church, then probably that's not the right place for me to serve anyway. So it didn't feel that risky. It was a 90% pay cut, which was um, <laughs> eye-opening for, for my family. Um, but we felt, uh, but we really felt that this is what we were supposed to do. And it is, uh, it's such a God thing, I think, because the, uh, the last headhunter I talked to right after I'd made that decision uh, called up with a chance to run an internet retail chain. It was an incredible job. And I was like, oh, that's a great job. I'm going to go work for my local church. And I thought, I will never hear from you again. <laughs> and, um, and interestingly, two years later, when I was not looking at all, very happily uh, working in the church, and, uh, and she called back and said, Jonathan, do you know anybody who'd be interested in Habitat for Humanity, which is executive search code speak for, are you interested? And I remember just a, it was, it was just the adrenaline just kind of shot down my back, and I just got quiet for a minute. And I said, uh, does it have to be somebody famous? <laughs> and, uh, and I went home and, and wrote this two-page letter about why. I didn't know if that was exactly the right thing, but I knew that was the kind of thing I felt God had been preparing for me. 
uh, all my life and then didn't hear anything for quite a while and then suddenly things accelerated extremely fast and a few months later um, I ended up with the opportunity to, to serve with Habitat and I look back and all those pieces that didn't make sense, every step along the way has been extremely valuable uh, in terms of, uh, of our ex highly complex ministry. And it is, and that time of seasoning and learning uh, in the church was just exactly the complement I needed uh, to be, I think, spiritually and personally prepared. It is, um, it is to God's glory. I have just a few takeaways um, that I would share that I have learned through hard experience. Um, one, I think sometimes, I know when I've wrestled the hardest to figure out you know, what God is, to discern what God wants me to do, um, sometimes what I really needed to do is step, by, step back and focus on making sure I was, I was in real tune with God. So not to focus so much on the what, but on the who. And I think in the same way, God cares much more about who we are, and we've got to work on that first before we work on the what. The second, which I've tried to give a little picture of, is we're so good. If you're in this room, you're probably really good at managing your, uh, everyone else's impression of you. And we get great at creating the, the public facade. And so much of, of, I think, the real growth is in the white spaces people don't see. And, and, and when we fail and hit the tough times, I think that's when when God does his best work often. And so really not to, uh, to uh, not that we ever will enjoy those times, um, but to, to make the most of them, because I think often those are the times where we can really grow. I think the third point is, um, a friend of mine said, there are problems you solve and there are tensions you manage. And I think particularly trying to, to live out faith uh, for business leaders especially, um, there's a great temptation to just wall off or, or sort of split your world and between your faith world, much as Steve talked about earlier, and your, your business world. And, and there's, a, uh, there's a book, um, a, book I, a book I like. Uh, that describes that called Church on Sunday, Work on Monday. And essentially the thesis is that, that a Harvard Business School professor who studied Christian business leaders found that the one group said there was no contradiction or conflict between their faith and their work. And what she found observing them is there was also no intersection between their faith and their work, ergo the title of the book. And she found another group that said, no, every day this is a messy, challenging, hard thing to do to live this out. And it was really living in the tensions of balancing all the, uh, the different challenges of, of work success and being authentic about living out uh, Christ's love through that. And, and she found those to be much more authentic leaders. And I think we have to um, acknowledge those tensions uh, and then just jump into the messiness of trying to do the best we can juggling all the pieces. And, fi and finally and lastly, um, and it's never too late. Our main job in life is to figure out our calling, our purpose, what we are on earth to do. And it is, uh, it is never too late for that. And the way we express our relationship with God is the way we care for God's people here on earth. And my favorite definition of calling comes from a theologian, Frederick Buechner. And Buechner said, um, which I love, he said, calling is where the deep gladness of your heart and the world's great need meet. Where the deep gladness of your heart and the world's great need meet. And, uh, and our job is to find that intersection and find that joy of, uh, of being part of, of um, what God wants to do through you.